I'm going to start it off with a patient with chronic dyspepsia and discuss the diagnosis and management. So this is our patient case. He's a 42-year-old gentleman with hypertension, prediabetes, who was diagnosed with gastroparesis and sought a second opinion when he came to UCLA uh, when he was concerned about his bothersome epigastric abdominal pain that he had for at least seven years. It started off with some repeated nausea and vomiting, epigastric abdominal pain about 12 years ago. He was hospitalized and upper endoscopy and colonoscopy were negative. He was diagnosed with GERD and placed on an acid blocker. His symptoms resolved. He had recurrent abdominal pain, epigastric pain, two and four years later. He self-treated with antacids, which stopped working. He would go to the ER when the pain got very severe. His epigastric pain was initially intermittent, but came, became constant. It ranged from burning to piercing to a bloating sensation. It was better in the morning, but it worsened throughout the day. He had early satiety, rare nausea and vomiting, and no unintentional weight loss. There was no consistent res symptom response to foods. His bowel movements were normal, although sometimes he had loose stools. He had multiple diagnostic tests, routine lab studies, another upper endoscopy, colonoscopy were negative. Upper GI with small bowel follow through only showed gastroesophageal reflux. Abdominal CT and CT uh, with angiogram were negative. He had a gastric emptying uh, scan. The percent emptying at 90 minutes was 25%, normal being 30, at least 35%. At four hours, 72% emptied, and the normal is over 90%. He was treated with PPIs, adansetron, metoclopramide, herbal medication, fish oil, hyacinamine, without uh, significant symptom relief. A physician had given him domperidone, which helped to reduce his pain by 50% and reduce the flares, and his early satiety was unchanged. So we're going to get back to the case um, after um, I show you a few slides of the management of dyspepsia. This is the diagnostic algorithm for functional dyspepsia symptoms. You always start with symptoms because that's what the patient presents the clinic with. And this uh, includes recurrent of postprandial fullness, early satiety, epigastric pain, or epigastric burning. Burning. Of course, we do a history and physical, and we ask about alarm features: unintentional weight loss, vomiting with blood, family history of GI cancers. If they don't have these alarm features, we call it uninvestigated dyspepsia. And you consider empirical therapy like a PPI. If the symptoms resolve, that's great. But if they don't, you would do an upper endoscopy. If the patient when you saw them had alarm features, then you would do an upper endoscopy anyways with biopsies. You're looking for an abnormality. If you find only H. pylori, you eradicate it, the symptoms resolve, then it's termed H. pylori associated dyspepsia. If you eradicate it, but they, their symptoms do not resolve, or if you never found H. pylori, then the patient, if they meet the criteria of functional dyspepsia, you can give them that diagnosis. Once you give them the diagnosis, you subtype it into postprandial distress syndrome when they present with postprandial symptoms without pain being a predominant symptom, or epigastric pain syndrome where pain is the predominant symptom. It doesn't have to be postprandial, or they can have an overlap. Now, when we've referred patients to upper endoscopy with dyspepsia symptoms, whether you're using a broad definition or the Rome criteria, the majority of patients will have a negative endoscopy. It could be anywhere from 72% to 82%. These are the Rome 4 diagnostic criteria for functional dyspepsia. Uh, they, you patients have one or more of the following, bothersome postprandial fullness, early satiety, epigastric pain, or epigastric burning, and no evidence of structural disease. That's why you have to do the upper endoscopy. They've had active symptoms for three months, but they started six months ago. That time frame is used to make sure that we're not misdiagnosing the patient. That may be just something that's more transient, gastroenteritis, change in medication, uh, something like that. So these are chronic or recurrent symptoms. Postpartum distress syndrome is a subtype of functional dyspepsia where they have to have at least three days of postprandial symptoms, which is fullness or early satiety. Uh, pain can be one of the symptoms, but it's not the predominant symptom. Epigastric pain syndrome is where patients have at least one day a week of epigastric pain or burning. Again, that doesn't have to be before a meal, uh, after a meal, but it could be before or after a meal, but pain is the predominant symptom. I want to briefly discuss the pathophysiology of functional dyspepsia because it, it's important when we think about management strategies. This is a gut-brain disorder where you can have central factors like anxiety or stress that amplify the symptoms. 
visceral hypersensitivity could be present, decrease fundic accommodation, where the fundus does, is not compliant when we eat or drink food. Uh, there could be delayed emptying, which occurs in about 25 to 30% of patients. They could have H. pylori. Um, and there's some evidence of these patients having duodenal eosinophilia. But that's an area of research. When studies have looked, particularly Leon Talk has done a lot of these studies, looked at what symptoms are associated with what mechanism. Can the symptom presentation help us determine what mechanism is uh, of pathophysiologic importance and we could target that mechanism? Well, it turns out a lot of the symptoms really don't help us define the mechanism that's driving the symptoms. But I do want to point out to, that, uh, to certain symptoms. So nausea and vomiting can be reflective of delayed gastric emptying. Nausea is really a predominant symptom of gastroparesis that can present uh, similar to patients with functional dyspepsia symptoms. Epigastric pain is not really so much a symptom of gastroparesis, but it could be indicative of visceral hypersensitivity. And early satiety has been a symptom linked to decreased gastric accommodation. There was a very interesting study that was just published in gastro, uh, gastroenterology by the NIH uh, Gastroparesis Consortium. This is a group of uh, investigators at different centers that have collected data on patients who present with gastroparesis symptoms. Now, not all of these patients in the registry have gastroparesis. Uh, some of them actually have normal gastric emptying, about 25%, but they meet the symptom-based criteria for functional dyspepsia. Now they followed these patients for 48 weeks. And what was interesting is they found that the gastric emptying scan could change over time. It's really labile. Someone who has a delayed gastric emptying at one time point may not have it later on. So they found that when at baseline, if you look at these gastroparesis patients, 189 of them, 58% still met criteria for gastroparesis that you can see down here, but 42% no longer met that criteria. They met the criteria for functional dyspepsia. With a functional dyspepsia group, the majority of them still had functional dyspepsia at eight, 48 weeks, but 37% met the criteria for gastroparesis with delayed gastric emptying. And what they found that the clinical features and the pathologic features were really not different. You couldn't just between functional dyspepsia and gastroparesis. So they were much more similar than different. And their 40 week, a 48 week outcome was very similar. 85% of the gastroparesis patients met the symptom criteria for functional dyspepsia. So this is basically showing that these, these disorders that we've always had separated really are very similar. When we think about the treatment, we can think about treatments for epigastric pain and postprandial distress syndrome. Let me go through the epigastric pain syndrome. Where really you would really want to test and treat for H. pylori, you would think about using PPIs. And of course, in all of these, you want to have a positive diagnosis, reassurance, diet, lifestyle advice, some over-the-counter re remedies, and establishing a, you know, a successful therapeutic patient-provider uh, relationship. There's been a lot of studies looking at H. pylori eradication and resolution of dyspepsia. And in general, these studies favor that you should eradicate H. pylori uh, in patients with dyspepsia. So if you do uh, suspect H. pylori, you biopsy or you do other tests to show they have H. pylori, they get better. You call them H. pylori associated dyspepsia. If their symptoms don't get better with eradication, then they're termed functional dyspepsia. There's been studies looking at um, PPI use in these functional dyspepsia subgroups. And basically, PPIs work better in patients with reflux symptoms and epigastric pain rather than the more of the postprandial distress or dysmotility subtype. When they've looked at studies of prokinetics, H2 blockers, PPIs in general, they show that they can reduce symptoms. The prokinetic studies mainly were including patients with symptoms of delayed gastric emptying. The H2 blocker studies were mainly patients with epigastric pain and PPI studies included patients with GERD. So they, they really use some overlap um, patient population. There was a pretty definitive multicenter trial done at Mayo Clinic and other centers, and this is an NIH a trial, where they recruited patients with functional dyspepsia, and they looked, uh, they, they randomized them to placebo, amitriptyline at 50 milligrams, and uh, a SSRI, escitalopram, and found that 
only tricyclics, the amitriptyline, was effective at reducing symptoms compared to placebo, and SSRI was not efficacious. When they looked at the different subtypes of functional dyspepsia, they found that the tricyclic agent was effective in the ulcer-like subtype, which is really the epic gastric pain syndrome subtype, but not in individuals with the postpartum distress dysmotility a subtype in patients with delayed gastric emptying. Moving on to the postpartum distress syndrome, we use, uh, uh, just like we do in the epigastric pain uh, syndrome, these other modalities you can see here, but we think about central neuromodulators like buspirone or mirtazapine and prokinetic agents. Buspirone is a weak anti-anxiety agent. It's a 5-HT1 uh, agonist, and it's been shown in a smaller study that in patients with uh, meal-related uh, dyspepsia, so more of the postpartum distress syndrome, that patients had reduced symptoms with the buspirone in the buspirone group versus placebo, which you see in, in red versus the run-in. Mirtazapine is a quadricyclic agent. It has features of uh, a tricyclic agent, uh, but it also has a 5-HT3 antagonist property similar to adansetron. And in this pilot study in patients with functional dyspepsia with also weight loss, they found that mirtazapine was associated with a reduction in dyspepsia symptoms, and it could help the patient also gain weight. The dose was 15 milligrams a day for eight weeks. I want to bring up another study that I thought was important. So prucalipride is a 5-HT4 prokinetic agent that is FDA approved for chronic idiopathic constipation. But we know in studies that a lot of patients with gastroparesis also have constipation. And because it was a protokinetic agent, this study by Jan Tox group wanted to determine if the 5-HT4 agonist prucalipride improved gastroparesis symptoms. And they found that it, they did. This was a crossover study, and they found that prucalipride reduced symptoms, upper gut symptoms, using a questionnaire that is validated in gastroparesis patients, uh, that it reduced symptoms in these gastroparesis patients versus placebo, including when they did a crossover. What was also interesting is that prucalipride also improved gastric emptying. A lot of times you see in studies where they improve gastroparesis symptoms, but it, they don't improve gastric emptying. And in this study, they showed that not only did prucalipride reduce postprandial symptoms, that it reduced, uh, it improved gastric emptying. So this could be a um, option in patients with constipation who also have upper gut symptoms and gastric emptying delay. This is an over-the-counter remedy. It's caraway oil mixed with menthol, and uh, this is in a purple box that you may know, it's given to a functional dyspepsia patient. And this was a study where they compared this agent uh, with, versus uh, you know, uh, uh, placebo for 28 days and showed that it was efficacious in improving um, epigastric pain sim symptoms as well as postpartum distress symptoms. So this is a table that you could look at that where I list the functional dyspepsia uh, treatments um, and just the key results. Uh, so a proton pump inhibitors are superior for placebo. H. pylori has a small but significant benefit versus placebo. Metoclopropamide, uh, uh, metoclopramide does not have any controlled studies in functional dyspepsia, has been used in gastroparesis. Domperidone has a global improvement without improvement of gastro gastric emptying time. Low-dose tricyclic agent has been shown to have benefit over placebo, but not SSRIs. Buspirone can improve symptoms and increase fundic accommodation. Herbal therapy, there's some limited data I just showed you um, that can be, uh, and there's also with Iberagas that I didn't go over, that has shown to be benefit, have benefits in functional dyspepsia. Psychological treatment has also shown to be beneficial in uh, patients with functional dyspepsia. And 5-HT4 uh, agonist could be an option in patients with delayed gastric emptying. So back to the patient case. Uh, when I saw him, I diagnosed him with functional dyspepsia, epigastric pain syndrome. He had mild gastric emptying delay. The key with this patient is treating his symptoms. So he had pain. He had mild gastric emptying delay. Um, and we know that pain is not really linked to gastric emptying delay. So you have to really treat the symptom and not so much the gastric emptying uh, delay, which was tried in the in previously, which was unsuccessful. I put him on a low dose tricyclic, disipramine. I didn't want one that had a lot of anticholinergic effect. I didn't want a slow gastric emptying. I increased it eventually to 50 milligrams. He had partial relief of abdominal pain, 
tried to increase the dose further, but he developed side effects of urinary, uh, increased urinary frequency and no improved uh, pain relief. He continued on peridone. He felt like it was helping his symptoms. Then I switched him from a, tricyc from a tricyclic to a pure SNRI, duloxetine. He did much better. Uh, he's been on duloxetine for a while. He only has a few days per year of epigastric pain, uh, much better than his constant pain. He noticed that stress can exacerbate his symptoms uh, and he'll get epigastric pain, but now he eats well. He tolerates his meals, a full meal. He doesn't have early satiety um, and uh, denies any bowel habits, disturbances, and no nausea and vomiting. So the teaching points on these, this case, increasing evidence of functional dyspepsia and gastroparesis exists along a spectrum and very similar. About 80% of EGDs are negative in patients who present with dyspepsia. You want to treat the bothersome symptom. Abdominal pain is usually not due to delayed gastric emptying. Prokinetics and antiemetics are not effective for pain, but they can be helpful for uh, reducing other symptoms. And neuromodulation should be considered when you're trying to treat predominant pain. So I hope this was helpful, and now we're going to move to our uh, panel discussion. Thank you so much for your attention.